Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for logging in to listen to me. Um, yeah, just a bit about myself. So I'm currently working as um, a midwifery tutor at King's College. Um, but previous to this, I worked on the caseload team for vulnerable women um, at Imperial College in West London. Um, and whilst I worked within the team, I undertook a part-time master's and conducted this study, um, which is on outcomes of women who were cared for under the caseload team. Uh, so I'll present those to you during this webinar. During this session, we, um, I'll just give you an overview of the existing research around continuity um, and maternity care for women with social complex factors. So yeah, so I'll present my study's findings to you, um, and then afterwards we can have a discussion on what these findings mean and how future services can be organised for this at-risk population of women. So social deprivation and pregnancy. We know that socio-economic inequalities um, in pregnancy and birth exist across the globe, but it's Western countries such as the US and the UK that demonstrate this widening gap in inequality, um, and that's shown to have detrimental consequences for women and children from poorer backgrounds. The NICE guideline for women with complex social factors highlights um, that women with high levels of social deprivation struggle to engage with maternity services, um, and they experience significant health inequalities. And the most recent review into maternal deaths in the UK found mortality rates the highest amongst women seeking asylum or refugee status, those experiencing domestic abuse, mental illness, learning difficulties and substance abuse problems. Um, this review also found that infants born into these circumstances are around twice as likely to be stillborn as those who are not. And further evidence shows that there's an association between socially deprived pregnant women, low birth weight, preterm birth and stillbirth. Um, research has also shown that in high income countries, women from socially deprived backgrounds are at greatest risk um, of the poor outcomes that are associated with obstetric intervention, that's such as induction of labour, epidurals, instrumental delivery um, and uh, cesarean section. So it's hypothesised that a lack of antenatal care and engagement with services is directly linked to poor outcomes that women experience, and therefore our policies are often focused around improving access to care. Um, NICE guidelines for uh, women with socially complex lives call for a reorganisation of maternity services to improve antenatal care, and it also advise commissioners to identify barriers preventing them from maintaining contact, um, and to overcome these by providing more flexible services for women. The NHS mandate aimed to improve inequalities uh, through giving women the greatest possible choice of provider and building better relationships between these women and their midwives by personalising their care. Um, and Midwifery 2020 actually states that most women with complex needs will benefit from continuity of care as it can significantly improve the experience and outcome for women and their babies. So it's known that a positive experience of maternity care from, uh, from socially disadvantaged women are often attributed to higher levels of continuity. Uh, these two studies by um, Borman and McCourt have specifically compared the experiences of women receiving caseload um, to standard care in the socially deprived area, which is very similar to my study. Um, and these both found associations between continuity, advocacy, individualised care and positive outcomes. However, a recent systematic review found insufficient evidence to recommend any kind of routine implementation um, of a specific programme. Um, for, that was for reducing infant mortality in disadvantaged populations, although caseload care wasn't considered in this review. So the review concluded that more evidence is needed on what interventions work to reach these um, socially excluded women and vulnerable groups. Sorry, that's just uh, your maternity policy. So looking at continuity of care in general terms, uh, there's been a growing body of evidence that has associated it with improved normal birth rates, less intervention and increased satisfaction. Um, and Jane Sandor's recent review included 13 trials of women cared for under caseload models in the UK. Um, and this slide just benefits the, um, shows the benefits and reduced adverse outcomes found to be associated with caseload care. So the review included women who were classified as both high and low medical risk. Um, it also included models of team and caseload midwifery. And interestingly, the effects were the same across team and caseload midwifery. 
um, and in those low or mixed risk groups. The review also found a trend towards cost saving effects for midwife led continuity care compared to other care models. So other evidence we know of, um, Hodnett found that continuous support in labour increases the chance of uh, spontaneous vaginal birth and had no identified adverse effects. Women were also more satisfied. Um, that review brought into question the effect of continuity um, on women's choice of birthplace and subsequent outcomes. Um, you know, so kind of what is the effect? Um, is it the, the continuity or the place of birth or is it both? Um, and are women with more continuity more likely to give birth outside of an obstetric unit and why? Um, Tracy et al. in 2014 found reduced intervention rates and cost reduction for caseloaded women and that was compared to standard and private obstetric care in Australia. And continuity, continuity of care has been associated with a number of uh, positive health outcomes in broader healthcare research. So the last national survey of uh, around 25,000 women's experiences of maternity care in England um, shows a significant lack of continuity. And I won't go through all these points, but just considering that continuous support in labour has been shown to be effective in countless studies, um, just a couple of these that I'll highlight. 22% of women reported being left alone in labour and shortly after the birth and felt unhappy about it. And 75% of women had not met any of the staff who cared for them during their labour and birth before. Just, um, just a point, so when reviewing the evidence around effective models of care, it's important to bear in mind this kind of umbrella term, um, continuity. It can be a component of many different models of care, which include caseload, partnership midwifery, group and team midwifery, and independent services. And also the inclusion criteria for these models often differ from trust to trust. So women might be allocated um, to certain groups by their medical risk status, whether they want home birth, their postcode or any kind of vulnerable factors that they might have. Um, so I'll start talking about my study now, which is titled An Investigation of the Relationship Between the Caseload Model of Midwifery for Socially Disadvantaged Women and Childbirth Outcomes. Um, it was published earlier in the year in Midwifery, and there's a link there if you wanted to take a look at the statistics in more detail. Um, for the purpose of kind of ease of talking to you on this webinar, I've just put percentages in. Um, for everything I present to you will be statistically significant. So for the purpose of uh, this study, I've used um, this RCOG definition of uh, caseload care. So a named midwife is a lead professional in the planning, organisation and delivery of care to a woman from initial booking to the postnatal period. And this contrasts with shared care models where responsibility is shared between different healthcare professionals, um, where women may not know their care providers um, or who have met them, uh, who, who was caring for them in labour previously. So if we look at the setting, so the site of the study uh, was at Imperial College Healthcare Trust, which is based in Westminster, and women allocated to the caseload team here must live within the trust geographical boundaries. Um, Westminster is a very wealthy borough, it's one of the most prosperous in the country, with the average income of residents being the third highest of any borough in the UK. And despite this, there are pockets of extreme deprivation and poverty. So the statistics here, I won't read them all out, but they're there if you want to look at them in more detail. They just paint a picture of a borough in the midst of an uh, inequality crisis with extreme disparity of income high levels of child poverty and a significant housing shortage. So in 2008, Imperial College responded to government policies and research recommendations and the statistics that you've just seen um, around the population in Westminster um, by introducing caseload midwifery to support the socially disadvantaged women in the area. Um, and the aim was to provide them with continuity and more individualised care. The team also makes up the Trust's home birth team, and this is a picture of them uh, winning the RCM Team of the Year award last year. So the team consists of six midwives, each is the primary care provider for 35 to 40 women throughout pregnancy, birth and postnatal periods. Um, the women are able to contact 
expect a caseload midwife at any time. Care is often carried out in the home setting, and the caseload midwife, or wherever possible, her partner midwife provides the labour care. Um, they offer monthly home birth drop-in and a young mums group. They attend all child protection case conferences um, and professionals meetings. They do joint postnatal visits with health visitors to hand over at discharge. And women choose to have their care in the community setting or at home um, and have full choice in planned place of birth. So this is the inclusion criteria for referral to the team. Um, it was developed with CMA's recommendations, the NICE guidelines and local demographics in mind. Therefore, this is also the inclusion criteria for my study um, without the teenagers under 20. And that's because all teenagers uh, that come to Imperial will be caseloaded rather than having to be living within a geographical area. So I didn't have any kind of comparison for them. Um, so this slide just shows how a caseload midwife can directly liaise with multi-professional services um, and co coordinate communication between key care providers and the woman. They might do joint appointments or ensure appointments are in the same location um, and they're as easy as possible for the woman to attend. And this approach tends to um, increase information sharing between healthcare professionals as well about the woman's health and social needs. Um, the caseload team do have a philosophy. It's too long to put onto one slide, but um, I can email that to you if um, if you email me asking for it. Uh, I've just I put the whole philosophy into a wordle, and these are the kind of main aspects of the philosophy that came out through that. So the team, um, how do they work? They they are very flexible. Um, in order to provide the highest standard of continuity as possible. For example, if somebody had a woman who might be being induced, then if they were able to, they might swap their day off that day so that they could be with their woman. Um, the team have weekly meetings where they discuss referrals, they debrief and they information share. They have monthly safeguarding meetings with the whole multi-professional team. So that will include health visitors, school nurses, social workers, um, a whole, a whole number of people, depending on the woman's needs. They audit their um, all of their birth outcomes. They have a monthly safeguarding supervision and regular updates with the lead safeguarding midwife at the trust. Um, all the midwives on the team are sign-off mentors and they have completed examination of the newborn course and NLS. That really increases the continuity, especially for women having home births. Um, and they've also done a number of other courses between them, uh, including the also course, masters, um, and they share their expertise through this. And they provide each other with a lot of support and empathy. So just going back to my study, um, so I collected data from a computerized clinical database where a midwife will input outcomes as soon as a woman's given birth. Um, so I collected the data from 216 women who had booked for maternity care and had been identified as vulnerable um, within the inclusion criteria that I just showed you. And this was between May 2012 and June 2013. So 21 sets of birth outcomes were missing due to women moving out of the area and giving birth in a different maternity service. 96 vulnerable women received standard maternity care and that was due to them living outside of the trust geographical boundary and 98 um, vulnerable women had received caseload maternity care at the trust. I then statistically compared the outcome variables of the caseload group to the standard care group. So I chose to look at as many variables as possible in the hope that some of them would be statistically significant. On the left are clinical outcomes that I looked at and the right hand column shows the processes. If it wasn't recorded in the computer system, I couldn't collect the data for it. So there are other things I would have liked to collect, for example, um, how many appointments these women did not attend. Um, but alas, this is, this is what I had. So the results. So this is a quantitative study comparing birth outcomes of vulnerable women who were caseloaded compared to those receiving standard care 
at the St Mary's part of Imperial College Healthcare Trust. And the statistically significant findings showed that more women had a spontaneous vaginal delivery in the caseload group, uh, more had an intact perineum rate. There were more um, water births and the use of water for pain relief in labour in the caseload group. And also more women in the caseload group gave birth in the midwife led birth centre. There was a reduced number of caesarean sections for those women who were caseloaded. They used less pharmacological analgesia. And interestingly, fewer newborns admitted to the, were admitted to the neonatal unit in the caseload group. And this um, finding had, had been found in the study. It wasn't, um, hasn't been reported in any studies before this. Um, so there was an increased number of women booked for maternity care by 10 weeks gestation, which is a, a nice recommendation for women with socially complex lives. There were more referrals to psychiatry services, domestic violence advocacy and other support services in the caseload group. Um, and more, uh, there's a higher rate of no midwife at time of birth. That was 90% versus 8% for the women receiving standard care. There also uh, there was a reduction in antenatal admissions and uh, mean average postnatal stay for the women in the caseload group. So we were really pleased with these outcomes. Um, and just to conclude on these, it, it appeared that caseload midwifery um, conveyed benefit and no harm to this group of women. The findings differed from previous literature depending on their outcome, um, suggesting caseload care may affect socially vulnerable women in different ways depends on their individual needs. The findings are encouraging. They highlight the need for other maternity units to set up and evaluate services for vulnerable women, particularly those with a focus on continuity. As it is unknown what component of caseloads um, in the study affected women's outcomes, it would be helpful for future research in continuity to factor for place of birth, um, also midwife's characteristics and autonomy and the impact of trust and support for these women. Uh, future research could also include investigating the longer term follow up of women and their families within a full scale trial. And the long term impact of these policy and research recommendations has the potential to transform maternity services for vulnerable women and ensure equal access, improved outcomes for subsequent pregnancies, child health and an enhanced social cohesion. <laughs>